It was the end of an age, an era when there was no great and hard distinction between popular music and the art music of serious composers. The music of Tchaikovsky and Verdi and Strauss, not to mention Gilbert and Sullivan, was popular music in its day. The only real distinction was between the music of the trained and literate musicians and the work songs and drinking songs of the poor and the peasantry, which would later come to be called folk music. But this was changing because of the growth of new types of music, the growth of the middle class, and because of changes in technology. In the 19th century, in the theaters and music halls and theatrical reviews that were now open and available to both the new middle classes and the formerly poor and peasant, a new type of song was heard, topical, ephemeral, often sentimental, often humorous, but well grounded in the canons of Western music. It was music to divert and entertain a popular audience. Also, in the later part of the 19th century, in the bar room and barrel house, the comedy hall, and on the vaudeville stage, not to mention the brothel, a new sound was growing in popularity, especially in the USA. Lively and infectious, often saucy, it was an amalgam of many elements. Some were borrowed from the traditions of Western music, others from Africa, the West Indies, and the experience of ethnic groups in the United States, especially the Negro in the South. And it often incorporated the ancient themes of folk music, work and drink and sex and love and crime and death and murder. It was called ragtime and jazz at first, and its popularity spread rapidly. It was later called jazz and many other names, Swing, Stride, the Blues, Boogie Woogie, and eventually, Rock and Roll. Meanwhile, a great change was occurring in the way people played and heard music. The invention of the phonograph and commercial phonograph records. The birth of a new industry, the recording industry. It was slow to take hold. Edison, at first, thought of the phonograph as more of an office machine for business correspondence than as an entertainment device. But it was to completely change what music was. Real music had long been notes on paper, which you actively bring to life by playing your instrument. It became a particular performance by a particular musician which you passively listened to, not in the concert hall, but in your own parlor at home. The phonograph was invented in 1877, but the first recordings on tinfoil were destroyed by playing them. That well-known soundbite of an elderly Edison reciting Mary, Mary Had a Little Lamb is from a recreation recorded for the celebration of the golden anniversary of the phonograph 50 years after the fact. When he invented the phonograph, Edison was a young man. So the search was on for a more durable medium than tinfoil, and all sorts of waxes, resins, and gums, rubber, harder though still soft metals and what we would today call plastics were tried before durable reliable recordings could be made the oldest known playable recordings in existence are from 1888 less than a decade afterwards commercial phonograph records were becoming available although virtually all 19th century recordings and most records made before about 1906 roughly are virtually unlistenable to modern ears due to surface noise, the primitive recording technology, and physical degradation of the material. It was into this moment, between the ages, that Dvorak dropped his composition. And I say Dvorak because that's the way I've heard it said. Maybe the first of many names I'm going to mispronounce. I hope you'll forgive my mispronunciations because the story is that interesting. From 1892 to 1895, Dvorak was appointed director of the National Conservatory of Music of America in New York. During his stay in America, he collected musical sketches based on American folk music. These would later inform his compositions, a 
especially his From the New World Symphony and his American String Quartet, as well as the Humoresques. Dvorak took a holiday from the conservatory in the summer of 1894. The conservatory archives have a receipt for $2,000 on account of salary from April that year, and he traveled to his home in... Uh, mumble, 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 I'm not even going to try. During his vacation, he began to compose a new cycle of short piano pieces. He originally thought to call them New Scotch Dances, after an earlier set of Ecossais that he had written, but changed his mind and called them Humoresques. He began the first one, Humoresque in B major, now number six in the cycle, on July 19, 1894, and completed the score for all eight pieces five weeks later on August 19th. They were published later the same year by the German publisher Simrock. They were well received, and the seventh piece, Humoresque in G-flat major, since known simply as Humoresque, almost instantly became a worldwide hit, and has become one of the most famous and popular short classical pieces ever written. But what did it mean to have a hit before there were phonograph records? It meant people came to see you perform. It meant other performers wanted to perform your work. And most importantly, it meant sales of sheet music. The publisher took advantage of its popularity, producing arrangements for many different instruments, various combinations of instruments, ensembles, orchestras, and even, in the USA, an instrumental arrangement for choir. Arrangements for violin were very popular, and humoresque soon became a standard for that instrument. It was an age of sheet music. People entertained themselves and their families by playing an instrument at home. For many families, this would also be part of their religious devotions. Being able to play hymns and other sacred music was a strong motivation. The most common choice of instrument, for all those who could afford one, was the piano. Nearly every family had a mother or sister or aunt who could play. If she had any ability, learning to play was considered part of a girl's finishing in grace and charm. But there was nothing effeminate thought about it, and the man who could pound out a few choruses of the Mockingbird or Harrigan was a man well met at the saloon and the lodge. Soon, humoresque could be heard from almost any home's parlor on a Sunday afternoon. Much of its popularity was due to the flexible, protean nature of the tune. It took on the feeling with which it was played, from pensive and melancholic to cheerful and playful. It was not a simple beginner's tune. It was not my first piano piece. It was a sort of song to which a young pianist could aspire, conquer, and succeed. 